Hi, it's Kate, and this is the third video for week two of Math 23. As you know, a linear transformation, t, is completely specified by its effect on the basis vectors in its domain. The way we're able to write down the matrix representation is to think about what each basis vector is mapped into, and in this particular topic, isometries, we're going to talk about a specific type of linear transformation and learn what the matrix representations of those transformations look like. I know a lot of you have been chomping at the bit to know what do linear transformations do to vectors? What are some that I can picture? And this should satisfy those questions. Let's get started. As I said before, the columns of T, the matrix, are what happens to the basis vectors. You have experience with that from the first problem set. All we have to do with these isometries is figure out what happens to the basis vectors and we're able to write down the matrix representation T for these isometries. Now you may be wondering what is an isometry? Well, An, an isometry is a particular type of transformation, a linear transformation that preserves the distance between any pair of points. And so since it preserves the distance between any pair of points, it preserves the length of the vectors that it's acting on. And since dot products can be expressed in terms of lengths, an excellent definition for an isometry is this one. A transformation is an isometry if and only if the following is true. That the dot product is preserved before and after the transformation. So that means that if I took two vectors in the domain and took their dot product, that would give me the same thing as if I had the transformation act on each vector individually and I would have two resultant vectors in the codomain and I would dot them together, it would give me the same scalar. Think about that again. The dot product is unchanged before and after the transformation. That's what an isometry is. All right, for the matrix associated with an isometry, both columns must be unit vectors. Why is that? Well, the columns of the matrix representation of a linear transformation are what happens to the unit vectors when they have the transformation act on them. Unit vectors have length one, so if an isometry preserves length, that means the result of having the transformation act on the unit vector will still have length one. So that's why both columns must be unit vectors. Their dot product must be zero. Why is that? Well, E1 and E2 are perpendicular or orthogonal to each other. Remember that dot product is preserved. So E1 dotted with E2 is zero, and that means that the columns of this matrix, which are going to be what happens to the basis vectors after the transformation acts on them, will still be perpendicular or orthogonal. So essentially the fact that we are always preserving the distance between any pair of points with isometries guarantees that we'll have two columns that are unit vectors and the dot products of the columns is zero. The first type of isometry you'll be responsible for totally understanding is a rotation matrix. So if we wanted to rotate vectors this is the matrix representation of that transformation of a counterclockwise rotation through angle theta about the origin. Let's make sense of why the recipe for a rotation matrix looks the way it does. We want to see what a rotation in a counterclockwise direction through an angle theta does to each of the standard basis vectors. Well, first, let's take a look at the standard basis vectors in R2. I'm going to scroll to the right and you should be encouraged to use scratch paper because you're going to want a lot of space to do this drawing. Alright, there they are. Now let's rotate each of them counterclockwise through an angle theta. Alright, there we have it. Okay, the first thing we need to figure out is what is this new vector? What has become of E1 after we've rotated it. Important, let's label theta. It appears in two places, I've labeled them both. Let's focus on this one. Remember that length is preserved with isometries. So E1 had a length of 
1, and the rotated E1 has a length of 1 as well. Let's label that. So now my question for you is what is the x component and the y component of this new R E1? Well, sure enough, this is a right triangle. And we have a hypotenuse of 1, and this angle right here is theta. Put the video on pause and try to figure out what is the x component and what is the y component of this new vector. Ready? Okay, it's pretty basic trigonometry. Using trig identities, the x component of this new vector is cosine theta. It's moving to the right, and the length of this is going to be cosine theta. The y component is going to be sine theta. So, RE1 is this. Okay, next I want to zoom in on what's happening to E2. That's going to provide me with the second column of my isometry matrix. Okay, put the video on pause. Try to think to yourself. Similarly, we have another triangle here is the hint. What is the x component and what's the y component of this right triangle right here? Do you have an answer? Well, it's still this right triangle that has an angle of theta right here, but now the x component is negative sine theta. It's moving to the left and it's the side opposite theta. And the y component is positive cosine theta because it's moving upward. Let's write that down. Note that the dot product between these two vectors is zero and the length of either of these vectors, which is the square root of the sum of the squares, is 1, just like we expected. And so this is going to be the first column of our matrix, and this is going to be the second. That's the reasoning behind our formula for the rotation matrix. Now let's take a look at a reflection matrix. I'm going to erase this diagram, but you should hold on to it. Just make space on another piece of paper. Here's the setup for a reflection. We want to reflect in a line that makes the angle theta with the positive x-axis. The only thing that you want to really look out for in your diagram is to make sure that this doesn't really look like a 45 degree angle because you can exploit symmetry and the problem becomes much simpler. So make sure that it's sort of an acute angle in here, really small, that is definitely less than 45 degrees so that these two sides are not even. Okay, let's reflect both of these, E1 and E2, over this line. Okay, here are the effects of E1 and E2 when I reflect them over this line. First, I really want to point out my notation here. On the page, when we write F of theta or R of theta, that means that the rotation of the reflection matrix is a function of theta, here I'm using this notation to indicate that this is the reflected first basis vector and this is the reflected second basis vector. I think that was pretty clear, but I wanted to explicitly say that. Okay, so we're going to do the exact same thing as before and we want to know what are the horizontal and vertical components of the reflected first basis vector. Well, of course, if we reflect over an angle theta here, this is going to be theta as well. Let's label that. So now we have this handy right triangle that has an angle here of 2 theta. And so take a moment, put the video on pause, try to figure out what the first component and second component should be of the reflected first standard basis vector. Think you have it? Well, just like before, the length has stayed the same. So this standard basis vector is length 1. And so the horizontal component is going to be cosine, not theta, but now 2 theta. The vertical component is going to be sine 2 theta. Let's write that down. All right, so that is going to be the first column of our reflection matrix. Now for something a little bit trickier. Here's our reflected second basis vector. Put the video on pause, try to figure out what the horizontal and vertical components are for the reflected second basis vector.
You may have already realized that this one takes quite a bit more work, or at least thinking about angles. Let's use all that work that we did for our first standard basis vector to help us with our second standard basis vector. Well first, just paying attention to the first quadrant. This is a total of pi over 2 radians or 90 degrees. And so far, just this angle alone is 2 theta. So what's left here is pi over 2 minus 2 theta or 90 minus 2 theta depending upon whether you're working in degrees or radians. I'm going to write it out in radians. All right. So this angle right here is pi over 2 minus 2 theta. Here's our 2 theta. Together they create pi over 2 in that first quadrant. Note that the angle measure between E2 and the line we're reflecting over can be broken down into two angles. One of them's theta, one of them is pi over 2 minus 2 theta, and so it makes sense by the very definition of a reflection that the angle between the reflected E2 and the line of reflection is going to be broken down into two angles as well. Theta and this mystery guy who is not a mystery anymore because we know it has to be pi over 2 minus 2 theta so that this full angle matches this full angle. Let's label that. Alright, we're so close. I really want to know what this angle is because then I can figure out pretty quickly what the different components are of the reflected E2. I could use this angle but there would be some additional manipulating because it's pi over 2 minus 2 theta. But all we have to do is note that this entire angle is 180 degrees or pi and so pi has to equal our mystery angle pi over 2 minus 2 theta, theta theta, and pi over 2 minus 2 theta all summed together. So this is what I've written. This entire angle, which is pi, is equal to two of these guys, the pi over 2 minus 2 theta guys, plus 2 theta plus my mystery angle, x here. Solving for x, what do we get? Doing the algebra, we find that this mystery angle right here is actually 2 theta. And so filling in the components of this particular vector ends up being pretty easy. Take a moment, see if you can do it, pause the video, and then come back. Think you got it? Okay, well, because this is an isometry, we know that the length of this guy, the reflected E2, is still 1. We know that this is an angle of 2 theta in here, and so that means that the horizontal component since it's pointing to the right, it's going to be positive sine 2 theta. The vertical component, it's pointing down so it has to be negative, it will be negative cosine 2 theta. And so let's write that down. So the reflected first basis vector gives us the first column of our reflection matrix. The reflected second basis vector gives us the second column of our reflection matrix and together they make the recipe for the reflection matrix that we see on the handout. This is exactly the same skill as we'll be using throughout the semester. You already found that on the first problem set the matrix representation for a linear transformation can be written down by analyzing what it does to the two standard basis vectors and this is exactly the same. But these isometries are particularly nice because we can easily envision exactly what they're doing and use trigonometry to figure out what the first and second standard basis vectors are being mapped into. There are a few other isometries of Euclidean geometry. Returning to the handout, we point out that translations and rotations around points other than the origin are also isometries. However, because the origin doesn't remain fixed, they cannot be represented with two by two matrices. And so they're outside the scope of this particular discussion where we were limiting ourselves to two by two matrices and the isometries they're capable of representing. It's also worth noting that the composition of isometries is also an isometry. That makes sense. That if a particular mapping preserves length or distance between points and it is composed with another mapping that preserves length and distance between points, the total composition will also preserve length. 
It's also worth noting that composition is computed by matrix multiplication. So if you take the product of any number of matrices that represent an isometry, it will also result in an isometry. And also, make sure that when you're computing what the effect of a series of isometries would be on a vector, you do need to make sure that you're computing this in a specific order that is preserved during multiplication. So if you were to compute the result of first reflecting and then rotating a vector, it would need to be multiplied in that specific order, like this. Remember that we go right to left when we're thinking about a series of isometries. So the first of the vector encounters is the reflection, and then the vector encounters a rotation. Calculating this product and then having it act on the vector would suffice for computation.